Well, good morning, and thanks for joining us today at New City Church. Uh, there was a guy who, who was speeding, uh, and uh, he was pulled over by a police car. And the officer says, he, he pulls this guy over, and he says, I, I clocked you at 80 miles an hour, sir. Uh, the driver was kind of confused, a little upset about being pulled over. And so he says, well, I, officer, I had my cruise control at 60. I think your radar gun was wrong. Now, not looking up from her knitting, knitting, uh, knitting in the passenger seat, his wife says, now don't be silly, dear. You know this car doesn't have cruise control. So as the officer writes out the ticket, the driver looks over at his wife and he growls at her, can you please pe keep quiet for once? His wife smiles demurely and says, you should be thankful your car radar detector went off when it did. As the officer makes out the second ticket for an illegal, uh, car, or illegal detector, radar detector unit, the man looks at his wife again and says through clenched teeth, woman, can't you keep quiet? The officer sees what's going on. He frowns here and he says, oh, and I noticed that you're not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, that's an automatic $75 fine. The driver says, yeah, well, you see, officer, I had it on, but I took it off when you pulled me over so that I could get my license out of my back pocket. His wife says, now, dear, you know very well that you didn't have your seatbelt on. You never wear your seatbelt when you're driving. And as the officer is writing out a third ticket, the driver turns to his wife and barks, will you please keep quiet as he starts to yell at her. And so the officer sees how he's interacting with his wife and he says, uh, ma'am, does your husband always talk to you this way? To which she replies by saying, only when he's been drinking. <laughs> Now, obviously, in this story, this guy is a bad guy, right? He deserves to get the ticket written for him. He deserves to be punished for what he has done. And what's interesting, as we've been, especially the last couple of weeks, in looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis, this is who Jacob is, right? He uh, deceives his dad. He deceives his brother. He steals the birthright. And so he uh, travels to go find a wife to where his ancient homeland was, some 500 plus miles from where he lived. And so if you were with us last week, we saw Jacob, who is, again, called by God, part of the covenant that God said, through you, I'm going to bless the entire world. So you have Abraham, then you have Isaac, then you have Jacob. He goes and he finds uh, some of his uh, family. He works for this man named Laban for 14 years. He gets swindled and cheated. And, and instead of marrying the daughter he wanted, uh, Laban gives him his, uh, his oldest daughter, Leah, instead. And so he has to work again to marry Rachel. And so he has two wives. Last week, if you were with us, we saw a whole mess where he ends up having 11 kids through his two wives and their maidservants. And so there's this, this big, all this issue, right? There's all this stuff going on where you have Jacob, who he really gets deceived. Jacob Jacob the deceiver gets deceived by Laban, and yet he's the guy, Jacob's the guy, who God says, I'm going to continue my covenantal promise through you, right? If you've been with us, Jacob is a guy, he's like this guy in the story I shared, who does not deserve to have good things coming to him, and yet in this story today, we're going to see Jacob and Laban continuing to go back and forth, but at the end, we're finally going to see the beginnings of Jacob truly understanding who God is and what God has done from him, even in the midst of him blowing it and getting it wrong up until this point. And so, um, if you have a Bible, <laughs> would you join me in Genesis chapter 30? Genesis chapter 30 is where we'll be this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's a black one in the seat back in front of you, page 25. And if you do not own a Bible, you can take that one home. It is our gift to you. So again, a lot's been covered the last couple of weeks with this guy named Jacob. Uh, he has married Leah and Rachel. He has had 11 kids. And so uh, uh, that's a lot. It's been a whole mess of a thing, jealousy, bitterness. And now he decides it's time to leave. It's time to leave Laban where he's been for 20 years to go back to his family in the promised land. And we'll pick up the story. Chapter 30, verse 25, it says this. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, this is uh, Jacob's second wife, the one that Jacob loved and wanted to marry the whole time. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, which is Rachel's father, uh, send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland. Give me my wives and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I have worked for you. In other words, Jacob again has fulfilled his 14 years of labor that he got tricked into, but 14 years of labor of his marriage contract to Rachel and to Leah uh, to uh, Laban. Now it is significant and it's helpful for us to know that because Rachel now has a biological son of her own, they, she had a son through her maidservant, but she had two through her maidservant, but actually her own child is significant in the ancient world because now it means that Jacob is not going to uh, disown her or leave her. Not that he was going to do that anyway, but in the ancient world, um, if a woman did not have children, she could be discarded or demoted in the family hierarchy if she does not have children of her own. That, that, that's something that, that could happen. And so therefore, Jacob, 
Jacob's request to Laban that they be able to leave after she has her child of her own ensures, at least in the ancient world, to her father Laban that Rachel will be taken care of. In other words, Laban can't say to Abraham, no, I don't want you to go because I don't know what you're going to do to Rachel who has not had any children. All right, now there is no reason that Laban can't, or Rachel, or sorry, <laughs> Jacob, uh, can't go back to his homeland. And so Rachel has a son named Joseph, which might uh, be interesting to some of you if you're familiar with the Genesis story uh, down the line. And then this is what happens next, verse 27. So he says, I'm going to leave. Tells Laban he wants to go back home. Verse 27, but Laban said to him, if I have found favor with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Then Laban said, name your wages and I'll pay them. 29, so Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me. For you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed you because of me. And now when, I, when will I also do something for my own family? Laban asked, what should I give you? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. If you do this one thing for me, I will continue to shepherd and keep your flock. 32, let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spotted, every dark colored sheep that is among the lambs, and the spotted and spotted and speckled among the female goats. Such will be my wages. In the future, when you come back to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats who are not speckled or spotted or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. Good, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. Now, if you're confused, like what happened there? <laughs> Let me just explain to you really briefly. Uh, again here, as we saw last week, if you were with us, Laban here is primarily concerned about economic gain. He's primarily concerned about what he can get out of this financially. He doesn't want Jacob to leave because he knows that God has blessed Laban by Jacob's presence, right? Jacob being here these last 14 years has really blessed him. And so again, this gives hint to us, if you've been reading, that again, God said that the family of Abraham will bless those around him. Right, And so this is what's happening here. Laban gets blessed simply because he's near Jacob. And so he makes a proposal to Jacob. Right, He says, uh, if you stay a little bit longer, I'll actually pay you. Again, remember, up until this point, uh, Jacob has only worked for Leah and then for Rachel. But now if he's going to stay, like he needs to build some wealth and some resources for his own family. So Jacob's solution is to come up uh, with a way to uh, easily distinguish the herd. And so what he says is that the sheep that are speckled or spotted, or in other words, uh, not completely white, uh, those will be Laban's, and the ones that are speckled and spotted will be Jacob's, right? In other words, uh, we kind of distinguish between like the ones that are like um, more valuable, like the pure looking sheep are going to be Laban's, and the ones that are less valuable, those will be Jacob's. Now, it's also worth noting that the percentages of lamb and sheep of, that are speckled and spotted is always going to be lower than the sheep that aren't, the sheep that are pure white. And so Laban is going to get the better end of this deal. I mean, maybe that makes sense because in the beginning of, the, of all this, this is Laban's flock to begin with. So he comes with a solution. Any of the speckled or spotted herd will be mine. Any of the valuable herd will be yours. Now, it's also helpful for us to know this is also a, a, a uh, wordplay in Hebrew, uh, which is what the Old Testament was written in. The word for white in Hebrew is also Laban. And so what it's saying here is that all the sheep that are Laban will belong to Laban. So uh, Laban agrees. Jacob is going to stay uh, a little bit longer and, uh, uh, and, and help uh, and make the flock bigger, to shepherd the flock and increase its number. So Laban is going to get the better animals and the more numerous animals. And Jacob is going to get the ones that Laban would not have valued anyway. So this sounds like a really good deal for Laban. Verse 35, that day, Laban removed the streaked and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats. Everyone that had any white on it and every dark colored one among the lambs, and he placed his sons in charge of them. He put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob. Jacob, meanwhile, was shepherding the rest of Laban's flock. So they come to this agreement, and then right away, Laban again acts in a deceitful way towards Jacob. Right? Jacob has his sons, has his family, take away all the male and female goats that were spotted, and he gives them in charge of his son, and he puts a three-day traveling distance between Jacob and the rest of the sheep. Right? So that, in other words, they make this agreement and then Jacob has no speckled or spotted lambs to begin producing offspring with by which to grow his own herd. 
right? In other words, it's going to be a lot more difficult for Jacob to have spotted sheep. Now, I don't know anything about shepherding sheep and lambs. Everything is all, all the stuff that I've read, but I've read that it is still possible uh, to have speckled and spotted sheep from a male and female goat that are not speckled and spotted. It's just a lot harder to make it happen. So Jacob already gets no speckled and spotted sheep. He's going to be in a really hard place if he's going to have any sheep that he's going to own on his own. So verse 37, this is Jacob. This is what Jacob does. Jacob then took branches of fresh poplar, almond, and plain wood and peeled the bark, exposing white strips on the branches. He set the peeled branches in the troughs in front of the sheep and the water channels where the sheep came to drink and the sheep bred where they came to drink. The flocks bred in front of the branches and bore streaked, speckled, and spotted young. Verse 40, Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face the streaked sheep and completely dark sheep in Laban's flocks. Then he set his own stock apart and didn't put them with Laban's sheep. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob placed branches in the troughs in full view of the flocks, and they would breed in front of the branches. As for the weaklings of the flocks, he did not put out the branches. So it turned out that the weak sheep belonged to Laban and the stronger ones to Jacob. And the man became very rich. He had many flocks, females, and male slaves, and camels, and donkeys. Now again, it's probably a little confusing what's happening here, but here's what's happening. Jacob is trying to get the strong of the flock to reproduce with speckled or dark fur so that he can take them, right? So he's trying to do what, what would be more uh, advantageous for him. He's, there's a little bit of debate what's going on here. It seems to be perhaps a, a mix of two things. One, he's using ancient superstitious practices to get strong goats to produce speckled offspring. So, for example, it was assumed in the ancient world that what the animals, what was in an animal's visual field while it was mating would influence the coat of their offspring. And so he's trying to mark them up himself artificially with these plants. And he's also putting uh, these things, certain things in their visual field to try to get these uh, uh, pure lambs to, pr to produce impure offspring, to produce speckled and spotted sheep. And, 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 any, and what also could be happening here is that also, I mean, he's probably, he's been, he's been a shepherd for at least 14 years, if not longer. Uh, there, he probably, he, there's a good chance he knows how to produce or how to increase the likelihood of two lambs producing a speckled offspring. So what could be happening is two things. He's relying on superstitious practices, but also skill and, and breeding to try to produce the type of animals that would be advantageous for him so that he gets to keep those. And the ones that are weak and not as strong, he's fine with those being white and have those belonging to Laban. Now, in any event, here's what we see as readers, that God again is blessing Jacob and giving him strong offspring that belongs to him according to the agreement that he has made with Laban. And he even seems to use some of his flock to barter and obtain more wealth and animals. It says he has camels and, many, and donkeys and many other animals. What seems to be happening here is he's apparently really successful and he's trading uh, what he has to obtain animals of other kinds as well. And so what you see, if you've been following along in the Jacob stories in the previous chapter, God blesses Jacob with a very large family, which is a big deal in the ancient world. And now in this chapter, he's blessing Jacob with resources. Now, now, whether or not he's going about this, Jacob's going about this the right way or the wrong way, or even with superstition, God is still blessing Jacob, still blessing him. And so here's what happens next, verse 1 of chapter 31. It says, now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's faith, face that his attitude toward him was not the same as before. The Lord said to him, go back to the land of your ancestors and to your family, and I will be with you. In other words, there's some tension mounting between Jacob and Laban and Laban's sons, right? Laban's sons are getting jealous. They're getting angry that, that Jacob seems to really be profiting off of Laban's herds. Regardless of the fact that that was the agreement they came to, his sons seem to be, get a little, to be getting a little jealous. And so God somehow doesn't tell us how exactly. He tells Jacob, it's now time for you to return back to the place where your family dwells. It's time for you to return back to the land that you came from. And so it says this in verse 4. Jacob and Rachel and Leah, sorry, Jacob had Rachel and Leah, his wives, called to the fields where his flocks were. 
He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude toward me is not the same as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that all, with all my strength I have served your father, and that he has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God has not let him harm me. Eight, if he said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep who were born spotted. If he said the streaked sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born streaked. God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. In other words, here he's telling uh, Rachel and Leah what has happened between him and Laban. Again, there's a lot that's happening that we don't know of. He says here that, that Laban has changed the terms of the agreement 10 times. And so it, Jacob has been successful. Things have been changed. Jacob is still successful. And so it's, now he says it's time for us to go. And so what happens next, I'll just explain to you. He, he explains to Rachel and Leah a dream that he had where the spotted males in the flock were mating with the females. And God says to him, he sees how Laban was treating Jacob. And he's telling Jacob, it's time for you to go back. I see how Laban has deceived you. It's time for you to go back to your family. And so he tells this to Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah agree with him. They say it's time to go. They also say to him, uh, in, in, re in reference to their father Laban in verse 15, are we not regarded by him as outsiders? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. In other words, they're talking about how they ended up marrying Jacob to begin with and uh, how uh, Laban kind of used his daughters to become rich himself and then used the money for the bride price on himself instead of saving it for his daughters. Like they also feel used by their dad. And so they're saying, we're good with this. We're ready to go with you back to your homeland. They also feel used. And so what happens next is the text tells us Jacob deceives Laban and does not tell him he's leaving. So he decides that they're just going to leave. They're not going to tell Laban this time. It's been, we'll see in a second, six years uh, that he's been with his flock an additional time. So he says they're just going to leave. They leave. Three days after they head out on their journey, Laban finds out and comes after him. So it takes Laban seven days after the three-day head start to catch up to Jacob and his traveling party. He comes to Jacob. He accuses Jacob of deceiving him, of not telling him that he was leaving, of taking his daughters as prisoners, which is the irony there is he doesn't realize his daughters are not on the side of Laban. They're on the side of Jacob to begin with. And then he even tells Jacob, on my way to come after you, I had a dream where the God of Jacob, where your God, he says, appeared to me and told me to watch myself and that I should not say anything good or bad. In other words, God tells uh, Laban on his way to come get uh, Jacob that he is not to harm him. That he's not to harm him. And so here's what he tells him. Verse 30. If you look down to verse 30 of chapter 31, here's what Laban says to Jacob when he catches up to him. Now you have gone off because you long for your father's family, but why have you stolen my gods? Verse 31, Jacob answered, I was afraid. For I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. If you find your gods with anyone here, he will not live. Before our relatives point out anything that is yours and take it. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. In other words, Jacob says that he left without warning because he was afraid, I think rightly so, of what Laban would do to him, right? He's living in Laban's land. Laban's a lot more powerful. He has a lot more people. And so uh, he could do whatever he wanted to Jacob. He's like, I'm, I'm going to leave because I thought you wouldn't let me go and you'd probably do more bad things to me. And so uh, Jacob responds by also saying, but here, here's the thing. I didn't take any of your household gods or idols. And in fact, if anyone in my traveling party took them, they should die. You can take them and kill that person, not knowing that Rachel actually took her father's idols when they left, right? He actually took his father's idols. And so Laban goes to look for them. And it says this in verse 34, now, Rachel had taken Laban's household idols, put them in the saddlebag of the camel, and sat on them. Laban searched the whole tent, but found nothing. She said to her father, don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So Laban searched, but could not find the household idols. And so a woman in the ancient world, if she was uh, menstruating on her period, she would have stayed in the tent. The only reason that, that um, Laban would have even gone into the tent is because he was related to her. Otherwise, he wouldn't even have been allowed in. And so she says she's on her period, uh, so she can't get up. She, sits, she stays where she is. He looks around the tent, but he can't find them because she's sitting on them. Now, the question for us as readers is this. Why does Rachel take Laban's idols? 
right? Especially if she's married to Jacob and he's supposed to be the God of the covenant. Like, should you not be worshiping false idols? Why would she do this? Again, the challenge is the story doesn't ter- tell us. The narrative does not tell us her motivation. Is it to prevent Laban from worshiping them? Is it because she knows they're false gods and he shouldn't be worshiping them, so she takes them? Is it because she knew it would make him angry? Right? After being mistreated by her own father, perhaps she's thinking, this is the way for me to get back at them. Uh, perhaps her, she herself wanted them thinking that they would protect her in some way. Or she grew up with these household idols, and so she might assume, well, they'll keep watch over me, so I'm going to take them with me. Or maybe she was taking them back from her father to, and to sell them because her father took her bride price from her. Or maybe there's a mix of motivations. We're not told, but she takes her father's idols. But what she does to them is what's supposed to stand out to us as readers. She takes the idols, she sits on them, and tells, them that, tells her father she can't get up because she is menstruating. In other words, as readers, we are meant to see a contrast between the God of Jacob and Laban's gods. There's supposed to be a contrast here. Whatever Rachel thinks about these idols, she clearly doesn't have the highest view of them as she's literally sitting on them, again, while claiming to be on her period. As readers, particularly those in the ancient world, the image that you would get is that them of being defiled and unworthy of use, right? Even if she was like afraid of her father, of what she might do, if you really uh, had respect and veneration for these idols, you would not sit on them. Like that's not something, you just would not do it. We're supposed to see the irony here of here is the God of Jacob, the one true God, and here are these false gods and the power and how we should treat them. I don't know why. It makes me think of when I was a kid, every summer we would go to this church, uh, this church camp in Virginia. And it was like this, it was a week long thing. It was overnight. And they would have, every night they have like their chapel thing or whatever. And it was in this big uh, awning thing outside. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, and there was probably, I don't know, two, 300 kids. And the, and the ground was level. And so I, one, of the, one of the nights I was sitting towards the back. And if you're sitting towards the back, you can't really see because it's not like on a slope. And to see, I sat on my Bible. Like I put my Bible on there and I sat on it because I wanted to see. And I don't remember how this happened or, or whatever, but sometime after that, I was, somebody was talking about like God's word and how it should be respected and how you should treat it, you know, with respect. And they were talking about even like the physical Bible. Like you should be, like the physical Bible matters. It's God's word. You should, you know. And I remember thinking like, I was terrified because he's talking about God's word. Maybe I made this connection in my head, but the like God's word, how important it is. And I'm like, bro, I sat on it. Like at church camp. Like, what's going to happen to me, right? I was like, I was terrified, right? But that's what she does here, right? Knowing full well, uh, unlike me as a kid, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't even know if it's right or wrong now, but you know, whatever. Uh, she knows full well, this is not how you're supposed to treat the family idols. She sits on them. They are defiled. They are not at all compared to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so Laban searches the camp, does not find the idols anywhere, and then Jacob, in response, becomes angry with Laban. He says that he has now been with Laban for 20 years, so 14 working off the marriage contracts, and then apparently uh, these last six years raising these flock and making them both rich and wealthy in the process. And he says, Laban has done nothing but prospered when I was with him. He then claims that if the God of Abraham had not been on his side, then Laban would have taken everything from him and left him destitute. Right? In other words, Laban was coming to attack Jacob, if not to kill Jacob, to take everything from him, including his, his children and his wives, and to leave him on his own. He's like, the only reason you didn't do this is because my God stopped you. And so they decide to make a covenant of peace between one another. They don't trust each other, but they essentially make a peace treaty with one another. They're, not, they're going to leave each other alone. They're not going to attack each other. And then it says this in verse 48. Verse 48. Then Laban said, this mound is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, the place was called Galid and also Mitzpah. For he said, may the Lord watch between you and me and when we, when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or take other wives, though no one is with us, understand that God will be a witness between you and me. In other words, they're making a peace treaty uh, because they can no longer watch over each other because, you know, Jacob's leaving and they're going their separate ways. They essentially are saying to another, listen, I don't trust you. You don't trust me. But since I can no longer hold you personally accountable, may God, everything you see, God, God is our witness. He hopefully will judge you if you do anything wrong. And so, of course, again, irony here, Laban talks, warns against mistreatment of his daughters, being the irony again, being he's the one that has mistreated his daughters. And then it says this, verse 51, to the rest of the chapter, the last thing we'll read. 
It says, Laban also said to Jacob, look at this mound and the marker I've set up between you and me. This mound is a witness and the marker is a witness that I will not pass beyond this mound to you and you will not pass beyond this mound and, and this marker to do me harm. In other words, we're not going to chase each other for the intent of harming each other anymore. 53, the God of Abraham and the gods of Nahor, the gods of their father will judge between us. That's Laban speaking. And Laban, or sorry, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and invited his relatives to eat a meal. So they ate a meal and spent the night on the mountain. Laban got up early in the morning, kissed his grandchildren and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban left to return home. So, so what you see happening here at the end of this story, or at, least, at least of Laban's part in the story, is significant. Laban wants, and it's easy for us to miss, Laban wants them to swear by the God of Abraham, which is like uh, Jacob's family's God or gods in, in the ancient world. Everyone had their own kind of God or God. So we'll swear by your God. But I also want us to swear by the gods of Nahor, which was the grandfather of both Abraham and Laban. In other words, we're going to swear by all of our deities. That, that's what we'll do, that we're not going to attack each other, that they'll watch over us and they'll judge us. But interestingly, Jacob in verse 53 responds by only swearing by the fear or the awesome one of Isaac. In other words, Jacob does, only swears by Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac. He does not swear by the gods of Laban and Nahor. He only swears by Yahweh. This seems to be, as we'll see in the next couple of chapters as well, that, that Jacob is finally seeing who God is and is finally beginning to accepting him as his own. Up until this point, again, it's always the God of Abraham or the God of Isaac. After this point, we're going to see him refer to the God of Jacob as my God. In other words, what you see happening here is that the beginning phases of the shrewd, um, many times deceitful Jacob is coming to recognize the blessing and the care of God. Right? At this point, he's got a big family. He's now very wealthy. Laban is coming with a band of men to fight and would win if they were to battle Jacob until God tells Laban not to harm Jacob. Right? In other words, Jacob is only in this position because God has made it possible that God has protected him, right? Specifically, God in his grace called out Abraham, made a promise to Abraham and his offspring, and was faithful to Abraham, as we saw in the story of Abraham. He was faithful to Isaac, and now Jacob is beginning to see how faithful God has been to him, that he blessed him with children, even though he was deceitful. Uh, he blessed them with uh, resources, even though you might be able to argue that he was deceitful again on how he got all of these resources. And then he literally spared his life when, Je when Laban was coming to fight him. The only reason that, Laban, that Jacob survives this encounter is because God told Laban not to touch him. And so again, up until this point in the story, Jacob is not at all presented as a man of high character and integrity. I, think, I would argue he's just like an average guy looking out for himself, as any of us would do, right? Again, you don't read the story of Jacob up until this point and think, man, God should really bless that guy. Like, he's just high character, high integrity, always doing the right thing. Like, that's not the portrait you get of Jacob up until this point. And yet, that's exactly what God does, is bless him. Right, the story of, of Jacob's life up until this point shows us, I think, how God relates to not just Jacob, but all of us. Now hear me, it's not that you and I will get a big family or ha have lots of money or get the thing. Whatever success looks like for you doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get that. But what this story does show us is that God chooses us. He invites us in. He redeems us and he loves us. And it isn't because of us. It's because of him. It isn't because we were awesome and deserved it. It's because he loved us and is a God of grace. Jacob, at the end of this story that we read this morning, is showing his realization of who God is, that this is the God, this God, the God of Abraham and Isaac. He has provided for me. He has cared for me. And this points us, of course, to Jesus, that you as I, as, as we live and, and breathe and work in our lives today, that we come to recognize, man, God's love for us is not based on our effort. It's not based on us always getting it right. It's not us based Based on us being awesome. It's based on God's grace and mercy. God choosing to send his son to die in our place and choosing to invite us in to his family. 
right? The proper response to the gospel then is not to try to earn your favor back from God, but it's simply to trust him, to walk with him, to accept the gift of salvation and to live in a way that honors him, not to get something from him, but in response to what he first graciously gave to us. One of the things we say often here at New City Church is that the scripture is a unified story that leads to Jesus. And here is how this story helps us see Jesus this morning. Uh, Here's what we read from this text. That is that salvation is a gift to the undeserving. The life of Jacob points us to show what Jesus has done for us. That is a gift to the undeserving. Listen, this is Jacob. This is who God is, who literally blesses Jacob and then literally rescues him, right, from being attacked, potentially killed, right? And for us, we need to understand, no matter who we are, of course, our life is going to look different than Jacob's, but all of us are like Jacob. All of us at various times have gone our own way, made our own decisions, done things that dishonor God, and yet God, is in his invitation of grace, invites you and invites you to come back to him. What's also interesting about the story is that even Laban knows that he has been blessed because of the presence of Jacob and the presence of the, God, of the God of Jacob, right? He's even acknowledged, like, your God is the reason this has happened. And yet, what does Laban do? He doesn't trust in the God of Jacob. He doesn't follow the God of Jacob. He continues on his own way, worshiping his own idols, right? Laban, just like Jacob, has had every opportunity to see this God of grace and covenant and truth, yet he misses it. He misses it. And so this morning, as I end, here's just the question I want to leave us with as we read this story. Will you be Jacob or Laban? The question for us as we read and ponder what God is teaching us in his word in this text is that will you and I be Jacob or will we be Laban, right? In the midst of our brokenness and the sin and the shame that we might feel in our own life, will we continue to try to do it on our own? Will we continue to completely miss God's grace, that God's mercy, that he's invited us to come to him and to experience his love and mercy? Will we be like Laban or will we be like Jacob, broken, have made tons of mistakes, uh, have missed the boat many times? But yet, instead of trying to continue on our own, we turn and repent and honor God, be thankful for his grace in our life. And would would we make the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, not just their God, but our God as well. Will you and I be Jacob, repent and trust the grace and the goodness of God? Or will we be Laban, continue to going on on our own and completely missing the invitation to taste and see the goodness of our Lord? Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.